Jean Vivanco is a professional remote viewer. In the 1990s, he began his own company taking up projects with various agencies and looking at some of the results of some of the most sensitive issues various agencies are interested in, in government and the military. He has since become a host of a very popular show on Rise TV, formerly Edge of Wonder, called Chronicles of a Psychic Spy. And today he's on Exopolitics Today to talk about his background and some of the remote viewing projects that he's conducted over the last 25 years. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome, John, to Exopolitics Today. Oh, thank you, Dr. Sala. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have someone who really is uh, an expert on something as really esoteric and kind of difficult to understand and apply as remote viewing. And I know you, your background is, is a very interesting one. Before you got into remote viewing, what was it that you were doing? I was, I was really a fine artist. I, I, I'd gone to school, got a degree in fine art. I was, what was I doing then? I was working... I was actually designing stores um, for some companies, you, you, just crazy, weird, like 1990s artwork in stores. So I was doing that. Um, I was also in this in-between phase where I moved to a Zen center and lived in a Zen center for about six years. Um, Zen Buddhism, just meditating, basically, really. Uh, and and it was it was I think it was 1995. It had to be 1995 because it was a Ted Koppel interview uh, where he was or he put, put this piece out on um, the remote viewing program because it had just been declassified. And I remember that moment because I was trying to grapple with what he was talking about that the government had had created this program of psychic spies. And the moment that I heard psychic spy, it was like this, you know, just this thing went off in my head of, of needing having to do that. Don't know why, because for me, I never considered myself psychic at that point. And so, so I embarked on trying to understand how to do it to the core, um, which, you know, it was difficult back then because you're, you're, unless you had $14,000 to learn remote viewing, you just weren't going to learn it. You know, I was a starving artist. So, so I had cobbled together uh, in online forums, you know, how, how do people do this? Um, little bits and pieces here and there. Uh, eventually grabbed hold of a, a CRV, the manual that came out of the Stargate program when it ended. Um, and, and really started to learn how to do it and then got formal training after that. CRV, that I believe that's, is that's controlled, controlled remote viewing. Yeah, controlled remote viewing. That was the methodology that Ingo Swan and Hal Pudoff created to run under the remote viewing protocol. So who actually trained you on? Prudence Calabrese. Uh, she was a... Um, I think back then she was working with Courtney Brown uh, out of the Farsight Institute. You had a lot of these, uh, and then I think, and he, she, she was trained, I think, by Ed Dames and Courtney Brown. And and then I was, you know, I didn't want to learn from somebody who was uh, ex-military or ex-intelligence or intelligence. So that's why I went with Prudence. And Prudence and myself became fast friends. And she, she had some connections. So she started to like pull together a think tank um, based on some funding. And so I helped pull that together and was one of the first professional remote viewers in it. We brought in other viewers and then we all became up on salary, remote viewing, working projects for businesses. And then we had intelligence. You know, they wouldn't be contracts. They would be like situations where it's I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine situation. In other words, it's like you would get a client later on when you worked with them. And they were always backdoor 
deals because no paper trail, no nothing leading to anybody in this. Um, not even a not even a security contract or a, a, a secrecy contract. So so we did this for for quite a while, um, but during the time that we were doing it, it was we would get death threats. We would have some covert group following us. Um, we would on the on the one hand, we would have a group who would literally be trying to shut us down and, and stop us from doing what we were doing. And on the other side of it, we would have other agencies or people in agencies or connected to agencies wanting stuff. So it really was strange to me because, you know, I came from this world of, of never ever thinking that anything declassified at best would be um, someone who's doing it would be harassed to the point of needing to shut everything down uh, because it's been given out to the public. And I never thought that the, that government or agencies would do this kind of stuff. So it was a, it was kind of a rude awakening for me um, and very scary at times, very strange at times um, because of the whole, there's a huge remote influencing aspect uh, that they would use. They would use um, sometimes like, You'd, you'd answer the phone, the time of landlines and, and talking to a friend or whatever, the line would click and then somebody would come on and say, stop what you're doing or we'll kill you. Um, Prudence really got the brunt of it. She really, really got the brunt of it. Uh, she, she was harassed really like out of the whole uh, remote viewing world ultimately. Uh, and, and I, 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 I like let it, lie for a while and then came back to it because there's something very important within remote viewing, um, which we can get to later. But, you know, some of the some of the things that we did work on, for instance, the FBI, um, we had worked with the FBI on counterterror issues shortly after 9-11. And that was really it was like we were we were first asked to look at um, the World Trade Center collapsed and the retaining wall underneath it that, you know, goes many stories down underground <clears throat> in order to keep the Hudson River out. They had to put a big retaining wall up. And first thing we we're asked to look at is, is that retaining wall breached because or are there cracks in it? Right. So if it was, they couldn't get anyone down there too dangerous, too hot. Um, <clears throat> and if it was breached in some way that could flood out lower Manhattan. So that was the first thing that we did for them, their request. And when they eventually got people down there, they found that it was intact as we had told them, totally fine. And so from there, they had asked us if we would like to remote view, like, you know, the whereabouts of Bin Laden, stuff like that. And we just declined. We declined that. We didn't, didn't want to be in that mix, really. You know, we were... We were of the mindset that we would much rather help people um, than drop bombs on others, ultimately leading to that kind of thing. So, so they really wanted to work with us. So we settled on future potential future terrorist attacks in the United States specifically. So we went through this like process of constantly remote viewing like potential future terrorist attacks in the U S and they would basically, um, take our data and, and respond or not respond to us. You know, we don't, we don't know what happened with a lot of the stuff, even though later on we'd see in the news that the stuff that we got in data was stuff that they say was being planned. Um, and I know there's a lot of controversy around nine 11 that we don't need necessarily need to go into, but you know, I'm with you on all of that with people on all of that. So outside of that, at that period of time, like we, we were already very harassed. We had connections in intelligence agencies. And one of my hopes and prayers at that moment was to really like be able to continue to do the work um, by giving this, what we thought of at that time, uh, this information to an agency that, you know, protects and would, would, would help cover us to some degree, um, as opposed to all the negativity that was thrust upon us. Right? So we were, we were hoping that would happen, but it didn't. In fact, it turned into a situation where 
um, we, we had been warned by the handler that we were working with that because of the Patriot Act, the new Patriot Act back then, we were in very close danger of getting raided because of all of the documents and information that we have. So when you're remote viewing, like let's say that you need to understand all the ins and outs of nuclear weapons, suitcase nukes, biological warfare, what types of things are used, how people make them. When you're, when you're a remote viewer and you're also an analyst and you're going through data of remote viewers and you're viewing yourself, you, you have to understand all of this stuff. So you have to collect tons and tons of documentation on it. And so we had troves and troves of information on all this stuff. And, and they were looking literally to, to raid us and then pin on top of us potential, but we're potential uh, planning terrorist acts. So, so really, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole deal of, of running a professional think tank uh, a couple of years down the road after that, just it pretty much collapsed because the IRS even got involved and took all our funds and got warned by many people in powerful positions to back off from this and not do it. You know, so it's a huge can of worms. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, you were getting results that were accurate enough that uh, these agencies watching you simply wanted to shut you down and you know you got the yeah. threats and then they got the FBI threatening some kind of raid and the IRS conducting um, you know, audits and whatever it was to kind of threaten you and and so that organization uh, that you and I guess uh, Prudence uh, created yes. transdimensional systems you, right. you created that uh, what I guess in the late 90s and it was called that would have been the late 90s right. yeah that would have been the the mid to late 90s 97 eight in that time frame right and we ran until maybe 2005 or six in that range and we worked with a lot of different people um you know it's funny remote viewing it's like it's the last thing anybody goes to. It's, it's the one thing that people will go to when they're desperate, you know, in the business world. Um, and we found that, you know, there, there, there were a lot of people out there that were in desperate look, situations with their businesses that needed help. So we did a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of work in that world, but just mundane, mundane stuff. We worked with hedge funds. Uh, we worked, we haven't worked with a, a company that makes amusement parks. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, we, we actually even did a little bit of work for somebody uh, in Pixar on scripts for movies, you know, because remote viewing is so open to just about anything. It's almost like a, a brainstorming technique to a degree. Um, so, so we worked so, so much. Um, we worked a lot. We also worked with people who were in intelligence. In fact, we would have sometimes um, very strange requests very, very strange requests like, and this stuff. So none of this stuff that we worked on was under any secrecy engagement. So, so it, it's, it's an interesting thing to me because here you have, at least to me, some of the most highly classified stuff because we know it's real yet. They won't put a secrecy agreement on top of it when you work on it, because then that verifies that something is going on. Instead, it's backdoor deal. You know, give me some information on this and we'll help you out down the road. Um, so one of the things, one, one time we were asked to look into something specifically that I suspect had to do with Montauk. Um, it was literally just a request about viewing this thing that I can't tell you exactly what it is, but there may be a huge problem that some scientists had created. Can you remote view? Can, is that enough for a tasking for one thing for remote viewers? And yeah, it actually, actually is. Um, can you view this and let me know if things got to a problem place with this? So we, we went through the process. Now, when you're remote viewing, when you're running a team of remote viewers, what you're doing is that, Every single viewer is is about professional. They've been doing it for a very long time. 
um, they will get a tasking from you with a random eight digit number associated with it. And you, they'd only get the number, right? So they only get the number. They don't get the part of what they're supposed to remote view because they're to remain blind. So you, let's say you got five remote viewers and you give them all the same question. You're going to get back when you're the analyst, you're going to get back, you know, 20 pages of information each from them. And then as the analyst, what you do is you cross correlate all the information in order to build a picture of what's there. And this method is, is really, it's very accurate. So this is the type of method that we use for um, intelligent services like the FBI for businesses, whatever. Um, is it's, it's, it's a very excellent method to get good information. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes people, but it works. So, so with this, what we got was that we had these scientists who were, were working on opening a, a, a doorway to another world. Actually, we find this quite a bit too in other projects we work on scientists working on opening a doorway to another world. And they had, they had gone about it from the standpoint of, of like a lot of hubris, um, very, because we can't, you know, it doesn't matter what the outcome of this, it's just that we can do it. And we had seen, because they did this, there was this irreversible situation within our dimensional reality and another dimensional reality that caused th this, um, these creatures, for lack of a better word, to be able to move in and out a lot easier to be able to it almost it's almost like it merged two dimensions together. Um, and and so a lot of the data that we got had lined up later on when you look at Montauk and research around Montauk and actually do a little bit more remote, remote viewing around it. A lot of our data lines up around that particular um, situation. So. So that was one of the weirder ones that we worked on. We also had worked on um, um, these, there were these silver balls that I think it was the New Mexico, New Mexico desert uh, that had appeared in the desert, just lined up over miles in the desert at a certain point. And we were asked to work on that. What are they for? Who put them there? Where do they come from? And what they appeared to be were um, these like alien, I would go gray, gray type alien, that body type um, um, technology that were like sensors as well as guiding platforms for a specific area. So they were there for a period of time and then all of a sudden they were gone. Um, and we find, you know, we find this, this quite a bit actually with remote viewing. There's like a... Um, Big interest in sites that because in this specific area we had some um, some some potential uranium. Uh, there was like um, debris from nuclear fallout or from from the earth from the land, and we actually find this like there's this place in in Galt, California, where we did this investigation. It was it was through a friend of mine who was a MUFON director at a certain point, and there were these guys that were taking photographs of, of what they claimed were alien ships in the sky flying around. And, you know, of course it's the typical thing It's blurry. You can't really tell what's there. There's some lights, it's dark. Um, but they had all these photographs, you know, and, and at face value, you just go, nah, there's probably nothing, but you know, we remote viewed it anyway, to see what was going on. And we got all the hallmarks of, of, of alien technology, anti-gravity, this sort of like dimensional construct um, that it moves in and out of. And we literally got that what they were doing since this area was right near a defunct nuclear power plant, what they were doing there was that they were, they were monitoring and going after anywhere there was some type of nuclear residue that had leaked into the land. And so they had been doing that for a period of time. So you see this, you see this quite a bit um, as far as what these these types of beings when they come here today are, are, are looking for. So is that the sort of uh, project that the alphabet agencies or the harassment was occurring for that because you're doing that well, kind of thing? Oh, so there's 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 a lot of things in that mix, right? 
that would be one of them. It'd be It would be this type of thing because what I've come to understand is that the UFO alien phenomena is one of the high, high, highly class, highest of classifications as far as, as far as um, military and intelligence goes. So, so the other side of this is that remote viewing, when it was declassified, it was, it was starting to have leaks around the program. And these leaks were going to expose much more than what they wanted it to expose. So for instance, Russell Targ had a treasure trove of FOIA documents coming because the original creation of, of um, remote viewing occurred at Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, uh, California, San Francisco. It was also a company, a, a, a business that worked with other people and not just the military. So. So there were civilians working there too. And a lot of the research went out to others. So there were leaks. And what happened was even though remote viewing went into this, um, into this uh, operational mode for quite a while with uh, the last one being Stargate, the leaks were going to probably prove to be too damaging to the program. And so they decided that probably the best thing to do was to out the program and then bury it deeper um, uh, once they've outed it. Basically, the air report, when you get to the CIA, what they put out uh, about remote viewing not really working is, is not true. You know? And so what we know ultimately is that remote viewing as it went to the civilian world was still being used. It's still being used today. Got to think this is very cheap intelligence and it's very, it can be very accurate as well with very trained remote viewers. We know that the CIA had wanted to control the output as it went into the world. Now, when it was released, it was a lot of ex-military remote viewers around it that were training in it, that were, that were doing stuff around it and controlling a narrative. <clears throat> we were not part of that. None of us had been in the military. None of us had any interest in that world. And we were getting a large chunk of interest from people as well as a lot of media attention. You know, we were going on TV shows like uh, primetime live CBS Sunday morning, stuff like that, demonstrating remote viewing back then. So we were getting a lot of publicity and that, that didn't like sit well because it was supposed to be this other group that controlled the output of it. So that's another aspect of it. It isn't just about what we were viewing. It's about who we were and how we were bringing remote viewing out to a broad population when it was supposed to be more of a controlled operation. Okay, yeah, that's, that makes sense that uh, they, they wanted to kind of like um, uh, declassify it, make it look as though it had been ineffective. It was a project that had been abandoned. Right. And uh, anyone trying to do it uh, professionally or publicly would be... a uh, would be scrutinized and harassed because that was the last thing the military wanted just to show that this is accurate exactly uh, way of doing intel exactly yeah yeah it, you know when 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 you when you when you're working in the field like so i'm a civilian working in the field we have contacts with intelligence they would tell us well you know in this other program that's going on right now they're doing this in this other program they're doing this so Literally, it was cover to drop this stuff even deeper, even more black into these very dark, dark corners. Um, so, yeah, I know it still goes on. In fact, when we were working with the FBI, one of the questions we asked was, why don't you like just make your own team of remote viewers? Guys just looks at us and says, you don't think that we don't have a team? <laughs> okay. So, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that kind of raises the interesting question about whether remote viewing teams that operate in these uh, alphabet agencies, where you you, ha you have a lot of um, kind of like compartmentalization, like very tight security, whether that is going to be as successful as uh, something happening in the civilian sector, which is much more free flowing, people are right. more relaxed, uh, the environment is more conducive, because that's one of the things that I've, I've found just i mean it's a generalization but you know the more you get into this kind of world of high security compartmentalization the less creative people are the less they're able to tap into these higher energies 
And so, you know, there's this kind of tension because the, the people who are doing the same thing privately are more successful, they're more creative. You know, and that, that's especially when it comes to like scientists trying to do reverse engineering of captured alien spacecraft. It's like the, the guys, I mean, that's the whole Bob Lazar thing, you know, the guys that in the projects, right. you know, they, they are just hampered and they just can't do things. But it's in the civilian, free flowing, creative sector that things actually happen. Well, he hit the nail on the head there because the next thing that he said, the next question we had, the next thing he said was literally, you know, then why are you using us? And he said, because you really enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> and that's really what it comes. I mean, that speaks a lot of volume right there. You know, we were we were dealing with it in a different way on an operational standpoint than they were. And that's what they were very interested in. They weren't interested in the cookie cutter military way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, when we look at remote viewing today, uh, you know, whether it's in XR politics or whether it's kind of like in any other field, you know, you, you have uh, those such as uh, you, um, you know, Farsight and crypto viewing that use uh, the blind scientific protocol. That, that's designed right. to kind of rule out front loading. But then you have a, a lot right. of people out there saying, oh, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll remote view the trade the World Trade Center or we'll remote view uh, what's really going on in Ukraine. And, and, and they, you know, don't try to stop any kind of front loading. They just go off there and they, oh, yeah, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm doing. And, right. and they get kind of a bit of a following. So, um, you know, to me, it's like, well, isn't that, a classic example of where people can just have their imagination take over or their biases take over if, if they don't have the blind protocol operating? Right. Okay. So it's, it, it is a very mixed bag. I will tell you that. Um, a remote viewer should, in my opinion, should always be blind um, to what it is there to remote view because that is going to be the best data. If you need to have if you need them to get precise, and because sometimes when you're blind in your remote viewing, the data is not gonna actually get to the point that you need that data to get to. You can put a monitor on them in order to talk to them while they're doing the session to guide them down the proper path to get that information without them knowing. So that is the best, absolute best scenario for remote viewing. But I will say this, a remote viewer who's been working 20, 25, 30 years knows what the signal line feels like. We call, you know, we, we call uh, when we're on the signal line. That's what we call it. So a remote viewer will know what that signal line is. They will know how to get on it. But that type of data, if that type of data is being used, we discount it. We drop it some levels down when we're in the analysis process. And it's a very rare thing that anybody would be using uh, uh, what we call viewer informed uh, working on projects because you have to keep things from going into that zone of just extrapolation on some story that you potentially have heard about it because that stuff is going to leak in. Even if you are a very, very good remote viewer, it's still going to leak in. So I think following proper methodology, proper controls in remote viewing is vital. And those that aren't doing that and then publicizing what they are, what what they have gotten, it's it's not something to really pay much attention. Yeah, to. so I would agree with that. I think uh, when when you have teams of remote viewers, three, four, or five people that are blind to the target, and yeah. they all have similar results that giving you information to me that's that's kind of precious as opposed to someone going off on their own saying oh yeah i'm, I'm remote viewing this underground base and this is what's going on there and i, I think that's you know that's where you, you can get the imagination coming in you know i mean the, the exactly right the remote viewing methodology um at base does allow for a certain amount of informing of the remote viewer if it's necessary uh, but but no, mostly everything everything needs to be blind, especially when you're dealing with things that you cannot get good feedback on, like alien stuff, uh, more esoteric type taskings. You you have to have blind remote viewers work that stuff because um, 
and multiple. Otherwise, otherwise you're going to shoot yourself in the foot and go down the wrong path with the wrong explanations. I mean, even then it can be very difficult to analyze remote viewing data around this stuff because, because remote viewers often don't have words for what they're experiencing when it comes to this. And it can be very, it's not like, you know, you're, you're just describing everything physically. And that's one of the erroneous things about remote viewing is that most people, when they hear the term, they think, they think, well, they would just be looking kind of at a movie in their mind. And, and, and it's this very physical thing that's playing out and it's going to be exact. That's not necessarily how it works. That's an aspect of it that sometimes happens, but mostly it's low level senses and feelings that are ripping through your body and you're, you're writing them down under within a certain methodology. And, and many people, they, we don't look at our world as being purely physical, right? Like this is my computer, but what is it? This is a table, but what is it? This is a microphone. These are high level concepts for these things. We use simile, we use metaphor, we use all sorts of different ways to explain things and find meaning in things rather than just looking at it as being purely a physical thing. And this comes into remote viewing as well. So you've got that to contend with too when you're doing analysis. So from 97 to around 2003, uh, you're, you're, you started up this company, Transdimensional System. It gets shut down because of all the harassment, the threats, agencies threatening you with raids, audits and all of that. And then uh, so you I assume you do something else and then you start up uh, another organization, uh, Right Hemispheric. So, you know, how many years elapsed and, and what did you do during that period? I was doing I was still doing remote viewing. So I start I took a little bit of a break. I went back to doing some artwork, um, gave myself a breather from it. I didn't know what I was going to do. Then I got contacted by a, um, a National Geographic producer. And I started working with the producer in the background on ideas, shows around remote viewing for National Geographic. And so we, yeah, we worked a lot. We, wor we worked a lot of ideas. We filmed a lot. We um, actually, one went to air called... Um, Psychic gold hunt uh, is just not good. <laughs> anyway, they were following me on a treasure hunt. Um, and that was another aspect that I got into. So, so he and I would also outside of that go treasure hunting, you know, using remote viewing data. Um, and so it, it, there, it's incredibly difficult to do. It's, it's not that easy. You gotta have, you've got to have yourself backed up with a lot of good treasure hunting equipment and gear on top of basically using remote viewing data to lead you to these locations, you know, not easy to do, but you know, adventures are always fun. So I started at that point, it, it must've been, oh, uh, a year or two after we shut down, um, um, transdimensional systems that I shifted over to doing that on the media side. And so from there, um, I started to work, a lot in that realm. Uh, I had a brief, brief period of time where I was working at a marketing agency and, and then also doing real, still doing remote viewing, running a team and getting paid on clients here and there, as well as doing national geographic. And so after the national geographic show aired, I got offered a, um, a show, um, uh, on discovery channel to do a treasure hunt and six episodes, but I declined it and decided to do other things. So yeah, went on to ancient aliens, doing ancient alien shows, uh, um, travel channel shows, whatever, you know, but ma mainly staying on the media side, taking clients here and there, not interested so much in that, but right hemispheric and the hemispheres Institute have been going on for I don't even know. It's got to be like 15, 15 years, maybe okay. something like that. Yeah. So you started around 2008. Around there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Around there. Well, one of the things I find very helpful about uh, remote viewing is that for me, doing exopolitics is a great way of getting, of triangulating 
on on various data, various sources. You know, like if you right. can get if you can get um, like whistleblowers or insiders or contactees firsthand testimony talking about something. You know, whether it's an encounter with an alien. If you get leaked documents or photographs, that's another source. And then remote viewing. To me, if you get that as well, that can really give us a good idea as to whether or not this phenomenon really happened. And so this is why I was very excited seeing that you had done a remote viewing project on the Skinny Bob video, because that to me was a really interesting video and, and no one knew what to make of it. So, so just for those who haven't seen it, we're just going to play it and um, yeah, just tell us as it's playing, um, you know, what it was about the Skinny Bob vi video that attracted you to it. Okay. Right, so skinny the Skinny Bob alien was, you know, purportedly that uh, from a crashed saucer, and this was leaked footage. Um, I had not seen this. I was, show it was, it was actually brought to me, brought to my attention by um, uh, Heather Wade, from she was doing the Art Bell show. It was it was shortly after Art had retired, so we actually viewed this for the Midnight in the Desert show and talked about it there initially, at their request. So what we found with the Skinny Bob, which was surprising to me, because a lot of these things are just completely fake, um, that there was a real being. This was a real being. The viewers we had probably five viewers in total, running about four or five different taskings on it. Um, that the taskings are questions. And, and what we found was like the, the, the cliff notes on this was that this being was part of a crash, that there were other beings with it when this craft crashed. Now, I don't know what crash it is because remote viewers don't get names of things. They don't say like Roswell, New Mexico. They only describe Roswell as a high level concept, right? They only describe things low level. So, so descriptively, this, this being was being kept uh, in this sort of like container that kept it, kept it moist. And it always wanted to go back into this container. Um, one of the big things about this being was that that, that would show up in the data was the viewers were getting like a little bit upset. Obviously they're blind, but they're sensing this. They know there's an upset being there because this being is upset. And this being basically just wants to get out of there. Doesn't want to be there at all. Um, it is pining for home. It is, um, it was upset with us. So one thing with remote viewing is that beings that have a broader consciousness construct than we do will recognize when somebody's probing its mind and these this particular being did know that and we have this method that we use called consciousness mapping and when we were consciousness mapping it started to say things like you again because we kept going back to look at it. it started to say you again you're back why are you here get out of my head i don't want you here um Obviously, this is like, you know, interpretation from the remote viewers as they're like probing it. But it was literally get out. Don't want you in my head anymore. At first, it was a little welcoming. Then sending viewers in again, they would just get like some nature scene out in the middle of nowhere. Like what was happening was the, the alien started to bounce the viewers out. So what this told me was that nobody had remote viewed this being before we had otherwise we would have gotten bounced from the beginning well that's interesting that's interesting that uh that the target if they're aware of the remote viewers can actually do something to block them actively because right. i i know uh ingo swan uh, I mean, the famous incident on the moon where he's, you know, he's remote viewing uh, an extraterrestrial and the extraterrestrial sees him and he just kind of panics and gets out of there really quick. And Axel Rod, his task is to get out of there. And, and, but there are others and um, like Farsight, Courtney Brown, um, I mean, his remote viewers, uh, they say, well, no, you can get right into their heads and the ETs can't do anything about it. So, so what's the truth here? I have literally been visited physically visited after remote viewing some aliens like 
like physically they have shown up. And this was something that happened in the earlier days of my career where we were working with um, Joyce Murphy and Ruben Uriarte. They had a television show called Beyond Oh, God, I can't remember what it was. Some like learning channel show. They would go on expeditions, paranormal expeditions. They wanted to understand what was going on at, uh, around the Arecibo telescope in um, Puerto Rico because people were seeing these lights in the sky. They also wanted to know about the chupacabra as in the side. But they wanted to know about these lights. And I was the first viewer in. And I was blind. And, and I immediately started getting these beings that were kind of landing in an area very specific area because they were interested in some type of um, life form and life forms that were in that location. And so they were coming in and I, I, I just remember that I kept feeling that they were looking at me and they could see me during the session. I'm writing all this stuff down. You know, they see me, I had a monitor. I think Prue was mo Prudence was monitoring me and, and they're coming, they're coming. They see me, they see me. So it was, not long after I'm at home and I get that, like, I started to feel drugged. I started to feel very tired after dinner. I fall asleep immediately and I'm having this crazy dream that has to do with space and obviously these beings. But what happened was I started to get poked on the shoulder, like physically poked, poked, poked. And I reached around and grabbed the hand and it felt like this slick, bumpy, I couldn't figure it out. So I immediately opened my eyes and I sat up and there's this creature in front of me. I'm fully awake. Creature in front of me that has a head that's shaped like a football on its side. I'd say it's like maybe three feet ish tall, right in that range, a little, maybe a little taller. And it's got this head. It's got underneath the, this football shaped head. It's got all these like bumps underneath it. And it's got this almost translucent nostrils. And it's like these little eyes, little black eyes on the ends of the football. And so, so the neck went down and it, the rest of the body just sort of like was a spindly kind of mess. I couldn't figure out what the rest of the body was doing. It didn't have like a human like torso, arms and legs. It was just like this like almost tentacly type thing. And so it's, it's standing there in front of me and I'm starting to freak out. I'm, it's like this, this intense, visceral, physical response going through my, it's like adrenaline, like roaring through my body. And I don't know what to do with this. So I start kind of on the verge of like screaming at it and backing up against the wall on the bed. And right when I started to do that, it, it let out this sort of telepathic burst. I could just hear its voice in my head. It says, stop what you're doing. It's like you're throwing bricks at me. So I stopped, calmed down. It told me that we are from the signal. We called that project the signal because it had to do with Arecibo. We are from the signal and we're here to help and we want you to help us. And then it just like disappeared. There was just like sparks of light and the thing disappeared. So after that, um, another remote viewer or two, I think it was two, had a similar type of experience where, where it approached them as well. So it does happen. They do sense your consciousness. I've had an experience viewing something on the moon before. Um, one of the, the interesting thing about the moon is that with remote viewing, there's this thing we call bilocation where, where you literally just almost step outside of your body and you see things and you know full 3d it's it is the movie in your mind it's what people would think of as remote viewing the bilocation experience i remember i was in a bilocated to a um a crater i didn't know i was doing the moon obviously on the crater wall was this big huge airlock door right into it and oh yeah there you go alien moon so there was this huge airlock door and and I'm looking at it and going, wow, this is a weird place. I figured I was probably on the moon at that point. The lighting was strange. And then I looked out into this crater and there were these little beings there that looked like capers, wrinkled, very wrinkled faces and heads. They probably, we never remote viewed them. Like we never went after to remote view them because what happened was their intention noticed, 
their intention went towards me because they noticed me. And so I bailed on it uh, because I knew that these things, if they capture your, if they capture you with their intention, there is a chance that they can give you a visit. So yeah, it's, it's, it does happen. Absolutely. So uh, uh, we'll come back to the moon because I think that's an important one to take up. But I just just wanted to finish up with the skinny Bob um, kind of like project because you you saw him, you saw the crash, you saw the craft, you saw the diplomatic uh, yeah. negotiations going on, and there was a kind of like an interaction with skinny Bob during this period. But of course, skinny Bob. I mean that was that that occurred. We're probably assuming you know late forties, fifties, or sixties. So, so I mean, how does that work? You know, you are here, uh, here you know, whatever whatever it was, twenty twenty. You're remote viewing something that happens in nineteen fifty five or forty nine, right? And, and and you're really and you're having a kind of a telepathic communication with the being that in an incident that happened seventy years ago. Yeah, there, there is no time. There's no time space uh, from the aspect of remote viewing because you're, you're utilizing really a fourth dimensional construct. And within the fourth dimensional construct, the tool of remote viewing flows through. So in that, in that, that higher dimensional zone, there is no time. You can go forward or backward time time or time doesn't work the same way as it works here for us. So, so it's like you are a time traveler where you can go back to the dinosaurs, have the experience of that, where you can go to the future. Um, there is no limitations on time. You will be interacting with beings that were truly in that time zone, not the video, right? Right. That, that is, that is fascinating. Um, that, uh, remote viewing just can take us to different time zones. Well, here, though, but listen to this, Michael, like, okay. So I, I was tasked once in a training objective, uh, target, and I had a monitor and the training was to remote view the Dresden fire bombing. Now I didn't know this and you know, this is the, during world war two. And so, so right at the end of the session, I bilocated and I knew I was in Dresden. I was literally running down a street. I started running in place while I was remote viewing and, and saying, I am in Dresden. I'm in Dresden and I'm on fire. Okay. So I felt like I was on fire. Now, when I came back from that, there were other viewers training and training as well. They looked at me because I was making a ruckus and I had burn marks on me. I literally had burn marks on my face and my neck and they lasted for about 10, 10, 15 minutes before they dissipated. So there's this physical effect that can occur based on the depth of the connection um, with a remote viewer to the target. That, that truly is fascinating. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about the moon and, and that's something that uh, I remember reading Emmanuel Velikovsky, who in the 50s wrote a book about these, uh, citing these different sources, talking about uh, pre-lunar cultures, that there were times, different tribes, and, and you, you've talked about in one of your projects, in your moon project, about the uh, a time before the moon, that it came into orbit um, artificially. So you want to talk about that? You know, what do you know about the moon coming into orbit artificially, and when did that happen? Yeah, you know, time frames are difficult to gauge with remote viewing. Um, it 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 looks to be so when you have the proselenes of Greece um, who talked about a time before the moon, for instance, um, who have some documentation of it, it would have been in that general range, probably early, early in their civilization, um, likely. Um, 10, 12,000 years ago in that time zone, uh, we had, we had looked at some things around the moon, um, basically specifically, okay. I mean, this probably might sound a little bit weird, but in the early days of remote viewing, we had this gray alien show up on a regular basis and it would mostly show up at Prudence's house and it would leave these, it would leave, it would literally leave footprints on the bath mat. And and in fact, 
oh, some scientist, a well-known scientist asked for the, uh, the bath mat at a certain point and she actually sent it to him. So we had, we had gotten a lot of information from this being because it would show up and give information on things. One of those things was about the moon specifically about the moon being put into place, which we had later remote viewed. Now, this, this being claimed that he and cohorts of his, whatever that means, was responsible for putting it place in order to completely destroy the current tidal situation on, on the planet. Because the intention of this being ultimately according to him, was to wipe out most of humanity because he had said that they are a future rendition of humanity and they totally messed themselves up. And while the main gray contingent is looking to boost their DNA, right? This is the story with humans' DNA. That contingent literally just wanted to wipe out the problem at the beginning, at the get-go, right? And so that was the idea of bringing the moon in, in order to like create massive tidal waves, wash the planet with water. But he said that particular situation was prevented by some higher source, some higher, um, some higher hand. Um, now I don't trust beings in general of that, um, of that kind, the, the gray kind in general. Um, so I find it, you know, I take it with a grain of salt, that type of information. But as far as remote viewing, um, there was a time before that moon was here. And when when we look at the con con the construct of the moon, I mean, not just like looking at data from NASA um, and what we know about the moon. I mean, many scientists are puzzled about the thing, don't know much about it, um, at least publicly. I'm sure they know everything they need to know. Um, on the black project side, but publicly what they let out about it is a very confusing mix of stuff. So the moon appears to be something that, you know, you think about when you get to, um, I think a class two civilization, class two civilizations in astrobiology are, are one of those civilizations that can manipulate planets and, and use asteroids as uh, spaceships and bases, stuff like that. So theorized. Um, so, so that is what I do believe that we've got with the moon here. Um, I know it sounds insane, but you, you look at popular culture and even a movie had just come out, which I thought was really funny. Sometimes movies can be very soft disclosure. I can't remember the name of the movie, but the movie was literally about the, and it was a Hollywood, you know, big Hollywood movie. The movie was literally about the moon crashing into the earth because the spaceship basically was a failing. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, the, moonfall there you go yeah, moonfall. moonfall. that's that's the movie and yeah it did seem to me to be a a kind of uh soft disclosure of, of right. what's going on and um yeah the moon is is a fascinating topic because you know you've got this ancient literature you know you've got your remote viewing results you've got this gray alien telling you about the moon then then you've got this kind of like you know, the, the stories about uh the moon being part of a kind of control system a uh, and clearly, you know, it being put in place, it is there to control us in a certain way. And I know David yeah. Icke is a very interesting researcher, but uh, he's, he said that the moon and Saturn are part of this control mechanism for the Earth, that there's some kind of, whether we called it, a, a, I think it was a soul trap or something going on between the Saturn and the moon and the Earth. So, yeah, what does your remote viewing results tell you about that? <laughs> Well, Saturn is a very weird place, very, very weird place. And, and our data did suggest some type of retransmission between energies of Saturn and the moon. Um, so yeah, right. You know, and David, I bringing that stuff up, it's not something that most people would take seriously, but our data backs that up a little bit. And one thing that I was actually really curious about what I found out, um, was that when the, the, um, Astronauts were flying over the dark side of the moon, the back side of the moon from us um, at a certain on a certain mission. They started to hear very strange sounds, very strange music, which sounded a lot like the, the, the tones that Saturn makes. 
I thought that was kind of curious, kind of interesting, because I know that there is something to the frequency of every planet that has um, an effect on us, whether we admit it or not, it does have an effect on us. And, and there has been a lot of Saturn worship throughout uh, humanity's culture, um, especially when you get to that black cube uh, as the construct of a, a worship around the black cube. Um, Mecca and whatnot. So there is a connection to Saturn on some type of control structure that we have. One thing that we did see that a lot of the cube type structures um, in that connection energetically to Saturn is, is a way to, to take and store information. Like for instance, when you have in, I think, Hasidic Judaism, they wear, uh, there's like a square that they put on their head. Um, I think also on their arm those things literally what it looked like was a transmission of information um, and databasing of information. Um, so, so that was like odd and surprising to me when it came to um, stuff with Saturn. Now it's, it gets very esoteric at the same time and a little bit difficult to figure out with remote viewing because you understand remote viewers are describing things on a, on a low level. They're not using higher level concepts. And a lot of the stuff around Saturn and how people describe it are higher level concepts. So, so we have to get really creative with the tasking on these things to try to figure them out. And even then, it can be very difficult to figure out. Yeah, well, Saturn uh, clearly in terms of uh, ancient mythologies has played a, a, a major role in, in, our, right. in our kind of like development and uh, I, I imagine that there's some kind of control mechanism. Some some contactees say that Saturn was the base, the home base of the Anunnaki. That that's that's how they kind of like control the Earth and, and the inner solar system. Yeah, that's an interesting thing too. You know, when you get to that whole idea, we had seen like the the Anunnaki had been in a region of our solar system um, that planet one of the planets was obliterated um and and another planet was later obliterated but partially destroyed in the process and i think that that was when the anunnaki um had come here to uh to planet earth and people have the stories about them um, mining for gold in order to fix their atmosphere and stuff we had seen that there is something to that because there was a damage to a planet because of a war that was happening deeper in the solar system. And, and they needed some resources in order to fix that, which they weren't able to fix. Well, one of the cases that fascinated me when I first got involved in exopolitics, and I actually wrote a big 15,000 word report about it was uh, the Dulce uh, Firefly oh, right. in 1979, uh, and that Phil Schneider said that he was involved in that, and and it's a crazy story, yeah. right? So, yeah, I mean this, I mean there's a lot of kind of insiders or whistleblowers that came out and talked about it. As I said, I've got a 15,000 uh, word report on my exopolitics.org site for for people to kind of look at the different sources. But you know, you did a remote viewing project on it, so so what did you find out about the Dulcie firefight. Well, uh, so the story literally is like all the stories around are like sticking your head in a blender. Like the, 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 the stories are like meant to confuse. They're, they're meant to disrupt. We find a lot that uh, these stories have a, um, once they get out, the base level is true. And once they get out, they start to get very convoluted uh, with intelligence services trying to deflect things and, and put up um, scarecrows here and there in order to get people off of them. Um, I thought you know a heck of a lot more about the story than I do, but I thought the very beginning of it, <clears throat> without remote viewing it, I thought the very beginning of this story, the Benowitz side of it, was, was, was pretty legitimate that he happened upon something um, very solid and started to go after it. And that's when everything you know, started to come out about it. So uh, <laughs> we had found that there was some type of altercation of 
beings that appeared to us to be tall grays that was associated with um what was the guy's name the guy that had his fingers cut off what um yeah now i didn't trust him to begin with ultimately when i when i feel him looked into him i didn't trust him to begin with so when i started to get data back on this stuff i was somewhat surprised but outside of him and looking at the situation straight up with remote viewing outside of him and looking at Benowitz, the legitimacy of it and m most of the details that you hear about it verified with remote viewing. I mean, we got that, yes, there were people going down these shafts down into this tunnel system where they, okay, the initial reason for this occurring was because this was clearly in the data that, that there were deals made with these beings through um, various groups um, that were very high level in the government. And they allowed these beings to take people in exchange for technology. Now, these beings basically were saying that we aren't going to do anything bad. We are just going to you know, take genetic material, but it got worse and worse and worse. So much so that they were, that they are keeping people in. And then create different hybrids that they can use. So, so this basically what happened was this group started to get, um, oh, yeah. So, so that this people were being kept underground in cages and sort of used uh, human farming for genetic purposes to mix their DNA with alien DNA to create hybrids, all sorts of different types for different reasons. And so what happened was the, um, the, somebody that was working ultimately higher up sent in um infiltrated to try to figure out what was going on because they didn't know what was happening and and at that point they got concerned enough to try to do something about it and so there was an, an initial attack in order to free a bunch of these people from that situation and to stop this from happening so that was the data that we got on that. And it was, you know, ultimately a lot like what Schneider had been describing, even though I never trusted that guy on the other remote viewing triangulation type taskings. It did, it did like lay out that same scenario over and over again. So yeah, I would surmise it did happen. And this, this is actually something that does happen as far as we've seen um, on this planet. Um, we, I've seen other locations that the same stuff is going on. Right. So uh, you know, I think there might have been a, a part there where you, you did kind of freeze a little bit, but you, I think that's when you were talking about the, the cages and the trapped humans. Okay. And that's, that's what I found in my report, that uh, there were people that were being taken and abused and used in these uh, kind of like hybridization or biological experiments um, by different aliens and government groups. And, you know, it was a tremendous human rights abuse. And, you know, right. that's what that was one of the, the principal things in my uh, in my report and I wrote it in I think it was 2000 and 2003 and I actually sent a copy to uh, one of the directors of Human Rights Watch in Washington DC because I knew her uh, but she uh, she just she just kind of dismissed it right you know, of you know, course it's like, you know, it's like who's going to take this up but you know here you have so he you know using the triangulation triangulation method you know here you have independent sources, you know, you have Schneider, you have these other people like Thomas Costello and right. others. Uh, I think there was a, a Christy Tyndall and, and, uh, and of course, Phil Schneider, all of these people saying, you know, there, there's abuses happening at Dulce. you got the, you know, the Hikaria Indians saying, yeah, there's stuff happening at Dulce. Uh, there's cattle mutilations. And, uh, and, and now you have a remote viewing saying, yeah, there, there are cages there or were cages there where people were being held in it abuse. It shifted elsewhere, I'm sure. It shifted elsewhere. I mean, there's, there's, um, we had looked into, there's certain areas where a lot of Native, there's a lot of disappearances of Native American women. And so we looked at some of these situations and we found that they were being taken into these locations. 
Um, and there's more than one. Um, there, there's, there's some in Alaska. There's some uh, up in Northern California. There's some uh, a lot across the Southwest in, in other countries as well. Um, just it doesn't happen once and then that's it. They, they, they move around as well. So yeah, this is something that's not, not, not a good thing at all. Well, one of the topics that uh, is of great interest uh, to me now in terms of exile politics is, you know, these uh, stories about the giants, the giants of old. Of course, you have the stories about, you know, the giant bodies, remains, you know, being in these mounds that that was discovered in the 1800s, well known, and, and it was, of course, right. it was, was covered up. And, and now you have... Um, uh, new sources saying that uh, these these giants, some of them were, are still alive, that they were preserved in stasis chambers. So, yeah, well, what did your you know giants of old remote viewing project uh, find? The, you know that the giants have always been a favorite of mine because yeah, you know, I grew up in California, and in California I did a lot of investigations. I don't live there now, uh, but I did a lot of investigations trying to find locations where they could potentially be buried because for instance on Catalina Island it's it's purported rumored that there was a giant burial mound in that in that area and the giants there would have double dentition and when you get into history when you get into what happened um, at the turn of the century here in the United States where people were finding these things and the amount of news articles coming out about it, it really, you know, piques your, or your curiosity. There is absolute compelling evidence outside of remote viewing to <laughs> suggest more so just say that, yes, there was a race of giant beings here. We see this over and over and over with remote viewing. Now, I think one of the most fascinating ones when it comes to giants has to do with the story of J.C. Brown. Um, the, the story of J.C. Brown was that he was a prospector for a mining company in the uh, Cascades, Northern California Cascades, in the early 1900s, 1903, 1908, in that range. So he was set out to look for gold in the Cascades, but instead what he found was that he found a tunnel that he claimed went 11 miles down underground. And at the end of this tunnel, it was uh, carved out into these rooms. And in these rooms, he found relics like spears that had a metal memory to them. Made, they looked like they were made of copper, but they had a memory. Um, lots of pottery, and he found, I think, in one room, a bunch of giants around six to eight feet tall, mummies, mummified giants, maybe maybe eight mummies. Then in another room, he thought that he found the king and queen of this race of giants because they were much taller than the others and they were dressed in royal garb. So he came out and, and basically kept the story to himself. He did go back to the site. I know that. Um, when we hear of this story today, it's literally coming out of the Stockton, a Stockton newspaper because at the end of his life, he wanted to take a, a, a search party up there. He, like he gathered all the community members in Stockton, California for, I think a month in order to take up there to show the world that, you know, what he had found before he died. So we, we remote viewed this and we found that, yes, okay, that, he he did find what he claims to have found absolutely 100 and that these giants were in that cave system because there was a massive cataclysm going on on this planet and they were looking to escape it so they went underground and we find this a lot with a lot of these giants if they didn't die and were buried in a mound when you hear the stories of these giants they were at the end of this this um time period on earth where a cataclysm mostly wiped them out. So I think that's, you know, to me, that's like one of the most fascinating things about it that really took me into trying to understand the, the long-term cycles of this planet when it comes to catastrophism, because we see this over and over with remote viewing and ancient civilizations and whatnot, that this catastrophic event occurred and the giants were part of this older civilization here. And they, they pretty much got decimated, wiped away. Now, it could likely be so. And I've heard the stories that you've heard, like out of Iraq and Afghanistan, where 
where supposedly military uh, teams have captured giants. In fact, I just heard one the other day, uh, something about they, there was one up in the Afghan mountain, the mountain, I don't know what range in Afghanistan, but there was one in the, in the, in a range there that was, that was eating the locals. It was kind of cannibalizing them, but the locals also treated it as a God. And that's one of the things that you find with these stories is that the, 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 the giants will eat humans you know? And so the military goes in, this is the story and, and, and they, fight the giant a bunch of military guys die the giant starts eating them eventually they kill them the story is actually coming from a pilot uh the pilot is claiming this happened so they load the thing onto a plane down at an air base once they get it out and they fly it to the united states so now that's a story that i think is fascinating um i don't know how many special operators can die like that and they can cover it up but it's something that we are going to remote view and see if there's any reality behind it. Yeah, that's an interesting case. I think that's the Steve Quayle story about the Bagram, so. Bagram giant. You know, there, there's one. Um, you know, I, I'm working with a military insider as well, uh, JP, and he says he saw a, a giant in a underground uh, civilization in Florida that was perfectly preserved and that was worshipped as as a god by the uh, indigenous peoples in, that were running that that place. They, he called them the ant people. Right, right. Well, I, I mean, you know, what, what we did see, it's like the J.C. Brown story. They did go underground, right? And there there is a big chance that they that they are that there are aspects of them still existing somewhere on this planet. I would I would completely be, believe it. I mean, you still have gigantism that, that flows through certain people in the population, which is related to that. So yeah, I mean, I can imagine that there would be pure blood somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. Well, w one of the things that um, I've I've found working with different contactees is that uh, you know the the giants. I mean, you have many different sizes, and I think a lot of these si uh, uh, giants were created as avatars for the extraterrestrials. That the extraterrestrials physically could not be on Earth because the, the Earth was inhospitable. For their biology, so they created these giants and they put them in stasis chambers. And so, exactly. whenever they needed to come on Earth and like you know make things happen in a certain way, they would just transfer their consciousness into one of these stasis giants. So it makes sense that they would some of these would be preserved for could be uh, for thousands of years because when the uh, when the Anunnaki or other ETs need them, you know they have these giant avatars that they can just go into and they come out and the, the, the locals worship them as gods. Well, what's interesting, what you just said, I find that interesting because we had looked at the origination point of giants. Like, like how did they, what was their first stage of evolution? Where did it come from? How did it happen? Literally all we got were aliens in the data doing genetic manipulation to create something for them. Now, now, that's crazy you say that because because while we don't have any data that supports they're using them as avatars that didn't that didn't come in like that wouldn't even be necessarily something it could be in the data actually like in something that was glossed over but literally we do have that the giants there is no like um uh, evolution process with these in other words it literally was something that was created by these aliens for their own use like specifically that was the data so that i can i can believe that you're probably correct on the avatar side that's so yeah. interesting yeah because if you look at the, data, <laughs> at, at the data especially you know when you look at the sumerian texts and they talk about you know something right. uh, numa elish and the atrahasis they talk about and of course, even the uh, Book of Genesis and the Book of Enoch, they talk about the giants. So, and and you find that historically, you know, they've been like, yeah, you know, eight foot, ten foot, sixteen foot, twenty foot, yeah. uh, fifty foot giants. And it's just like, why? You know, that couldn't be natural. That couldn't be biological evolution. I, I think what makes sense is that you know, they created different giants. So, you know, like the supreme leader of the Anunnaki, Anu or Enlil or right. Enki, when they wanted to come in, you know, they 
the the best avatar, you know, a fifty foot giant would yeah. be theirs. You know, and then they'd have like uh, one of the Ajinji, you know, one of the lesser gods. He'd come in, you know, there'd be a twenty foot giant avatar for him, and and so right. on. It goes. That kind of makes more sense to me. It, you know what? I think I think you nailed it there. I seriously do because that literally lines up with our data and makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. That's like a that's like a missing piece of the puzzle for me that you probably just filled. That's really fascinating. Yeah, really fascinating. So so what are the, I know you have got this um, Chronicles of a Psychic Spy that's running. I know you have got a lot of projects, and maybe we can have you back to talk about Absolutely. some of those projects. But um, you know, what are you working on right now? What we've got going on, well, I'm doing, yeah, the Chronicles of a Psychic Spy show as well as the Metaphysical show. Uh, it's also on Rise, but all the podcast channels and YouTube and stuff. I'm also teaching. I teach remote viewing uh, through hemispheres.institute uh, and also right hemispheric um, remote viewing. Um, what I'm doing like specifically right now is I'm working on a film where I am going to the ancient cataclysm the one that happened during the younger dryas period that graham hancock um, has spoken about and so what we're doing is we're re remote viewing that and i'm going on a um, uh, expedition to the basically the scab lands from in the washington state area to film that area and line up our data with uh, the potential cause of that particular cataclysm and then get into the evidence and remote viewing evidence behind the uh, ancient civilization that was basically wiped out by that cataclysm. So I'm working on that as a film at the moment. Well, that, that, that'll be fascinating. Yeah. So uh, if people want to kind of like subscribe or find out more about your work, they just go to the, uh, to your to your website? Yeah, just go to hemispheres.institute. Actually, righthemispheric.com should be redirecting to hemispheres.institute, hopefully. Sometimes it's buggy. Uh, but hemispheres.institute is a little bit better to find me at. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, John, for, for doing all this incredible work. I think uh, your information is, is really important to, to well, you. Well, really back so at you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we're all trying to find the truth on these very esoteric to topics. And I think, uh, you know, what you're doing is invaluable for my research. So, so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Absolutely welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.